Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the May Lee Show. I'm glad you could join me. It's good to have you. Um, I can't believe that the year is almost over, 2021. Uh, I don't know about you, but this year has definitely gone by a lot quicker than last year did, but I guess that's understandable given the fact that we were, um, you know, locked up in our homes for most of the year last year. Um, but uh, the pandemic isn't over, as we know. Uh, there's all these new variants, and now Omicron is sort of spreading uh, around the world. So we still have to stay vigilant. We have to stay safe and healthy, and I hope all of you are. Um, but uh, but yeah, holiday, holiday season. You can see my tree in the back. Uh, I do love Christmas. So uh, anyway, I just got back from New York City recently uh, because I was invited to attend an event to celebrate the honorees of the Forbes 50 over 50 list. And uh, this was something that Forbes decided to do for the first time, honoring women over the age of 50 who are doing unique uh, things in their fields or whatever, you know, many different walks of life and many different uh, industries, everyone from artists to activists to scientists and researchers and, you know, politicians and business people. So uh, they got us together in New York um, to celebrate uh, being on this these different lists. And so it was really an honor uh, to be with these incredible women. And also for me personally, this honor wasn't about me. I was just so happy that Forbes was willing to acknowledge the importance of the work that I had started with the AAPI community, especially fighting anti-Asian hate. And that's why I was put on the impact list of the 50 over 50. And so I didn't want it to be ego-driven. I really wanted to acknowledge the fact that Forbes was willing to put a spotlight on this movement, on the importance of what was going on and what's been going on. And so I really appreciated that. And then to meet other women doing such phenomenal things in their industries. I mean, I met women who were developing a breast cancer drug to fight, you know, really advanced breast cancer. Another woman who was developing a new antibiotic that was going to treat very serious disease. Um, I met financial people. I met, you know, teachers. I met a local mayor who had been a math teacher for 33 years. And then one woman who I was so honored to meet was Opal Lee. 95 years old, and she is known as the grandmother of the Juneteenth movement. And Juneteenth, uh, if those of you don't know, June 17th is the date when uh, the abolition of slavery happened. And so she pushed for June 17th to become a federal holiday. And she was successful because just this past June 17th, uh, President Biden signed that into law. So to meet Opal Lee, 95, and still kicking, still doing so well, and still, you know, uh, right in there was such an honor. So again, it just, this list really goes to show that women who are older, we're nowhere near done uh, with what we have to do, and that we're only getting better, and we're using our wisdom and experience to do some good in the world and to then pass it along uh, to the younger generation. So um, hats off to all these women that I met and all, all of them who are doing such great work. And I'm just uh, humbled to be part of this group. So New York, there's a connection here <laughs> with the show. New York, of course, as we know, is you know synonymous with live theater, right? Broadway, there's nothing like Broadway. And during the pandemic, Broadway had to shut down. It went dark for the longest time it's ever gone dark. And this was, you know, this was uh, pretty tragic for the theatrical world uh, to be shut down for so long. Uh, so I had a chance to interview one of the greatest playwrights uh, uh, of our age, and that is David Henry Huang. Um, not only is he the OG of Asian American playwrights, without a doubt, he is, so respected and so accomplished in just the overall 
playwriting theatrical world. You know, some of his stage work includes M. Butterfly, Yellow Face, Chinglish, Golden Child. Um, and then he went on to produce this musical back in 2018 called Soft Power. And I actually got to interview him at that point when it was uh, performing in L.A., and it was debuting and I was able to see the musical and interview him. And I remember that very vividly uh, because it was such a powerful musical about politics um, and about identity politics, about being Asian, American, Chinese soft power, U.S. relations. I mean, it was just this whole combination of so many different themes and somewhat autobiographical for David Henry Huang. Uh, and so I wanted to sh show you a little clip from the piece I did about David Henry Huang, because that'll give you a nice little intro, and then I'll come back and, and we'll go to the interview. One of Huang's best-known works is M. Butterfly, loosely based on the true story of a French diplomat who has a long love affair with a Peking opera star, whom he thinks is a woman, but is actually a man. The play was recently revived on... Huang won the Tony Award for M. Butterfly in 1988, becoming the first Asian American to win in that category. He was also nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. In 1998, Huang was nominated for another Tony Award for Golden Child, a play about an early 20th century Chinese family facing westernization. And in 2007, Huang again was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for Yellow Face, a semi-autobiographical play that examines really questions of race, representation, and politics. Oh, but the list of Huang achievements is much, much longer. Other award-winning works include Flower Drum Song, Face Value, Aida, and Chinglish, a comedy about miscommunication between East and West. I recently assumed control of Ohio signage and now direct all its operations. I am sorry, direct what? All our operations. Ah, thank you. So as you can see, David is prolific. I mean, he has produced so many great works and he's won Grammy Awards, he has won a Tony Award, he's won several Obie Awards, he has been nominated um, for uh, the Pulitzer Prize in drama. So, you know, he, he, he definitely is an overachiever. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so he's also featured in this PBS documentary, a 30-minute documentary that uh, recently came out called The First 20, and it's the first 20 years of Asian American playwriting. And so it features David as well as other Asian American playwrights. And so what, you know, their thoughts are on what's happened over the last 20 years. And David, of course, is, you know, at the forefront of that. Uh, but I had a chance to speak with him just recently and about that documentary, but just about all the things that have been happening, especially in the last two years and how he is a playwright and a content creator, obviously for television and film as well, how that's influencing his ideas and some, you know, some serious discussions about the state of the world and the state of this country. So here is that interview. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. It's so good to see you. Hey, it's good to be um, speaking with you again. I know, I know. I was just saying to you before we started recording that I just rewatched our 2018 interview when uh, Soft Power, your musical, was uh, playing here in L.A., um, and I got to tell you, David, it was really interesting listening to that interview uh, back then because obviously things have changed quite a bit uh, since then. We were talking about identity politics, being Asian American, feeling like an outsider, but things we were hoping that things were going to get better. I got to ask you, how are you feeling these days about things? I mean, we obviously have uh, since 2018. Um, experienced this huge spike in anti-Asian hate and attacks. Um, and if anything, I feel like the show that we talked about then, which then came to New York in 2019, uh, became even more uh, relevant because it pivots on 
uh, a hate attack that I actually survived. Um, and so the, it, while it was incredibly dispiriting over the past two years um, to uh, witness and feel um, triggered yeah. by these attacks, um, um, I, I guess the plus side is that a um, historically it you know it it it's not like it's never happened before. Yes, it, it happens regularly right. uh, in American history whenever there is tension between the U.S. and any other nation. But also, um, it led to a moment where um, AAPIs started to organize, right. started to realize that the model minority trope will not save us. Yeah. Um, and that the only way to combat this is not to try to accommodate uh, racism, but to try to oppose and organize against white racism. And also um, that non-Asians, I think, became conscious of um, anti-Asian hate. Uh, many of them for the first time, whereas we always, you know, we would hear or it would be implied that uh, Asians don't suffer from racism. Yes. And I don't think, th I think uh, th the majority of Americans have now realized that we do. Well, I mean, David, I, I say this to everyone all the time, including my students at USC, is that, you know, the, the stereotype still exists where everybody thinks that Asians are fine, we're all crazy and we're all rich and we're all educated. Right. So therefore, what problems could we possibly have and what kind of complaint could we possibly make when everything is seemingly fine? So that certainly has to be dismantled, that kind of stereotype that is pretty wrong. As we know, Asians have the biggest economic disparity of any ethnic group. Um, and a lot of folks don't even know that. Um, but David, let me go back because some people might have been like, when you first started talking uh, about your own hate attack, they may be like, what? What are you talking about? I, of course, know this story. And some folks might, but you were attacked in, what, was it 2015 in New York? It was yeah, 2015, it was 2015. Right? Um, yeah. So I sort of consider myself like now an, an OG um, hate attack survivor. I know. Horrible um, to say, but kind of true. <laughs> um. And yeah, I was just to try to make a long story short. I was um, I was right after Thanksgiving in 2015. I was walking on my block about 9 p.m. on the Sunday. I'd gotten some groceries, and um, uh, I felt something hit me on the back of my neck. And I was like, uh, "What the f? I, I don't know if I can say this on your program." You so, can. You totally um, okay. can. So I was like, "What the fuck?" And yeah. I saw I saw the shadow of somebody running away. Uh, and I put my hand up to where I'd been hit, and it came away covered with blood. Uh, and I was able to uh, walk home, drop off the groceries. Um, I said to my wife and daughter, I think I've been attacked. But we, we live about two blocks away from, um, I live in Brooklyn, from Brooklyn Hospital. Um, so I was able to walk to the ER and then passed out there and ended up that my vertebral artery had been severed and I lost about a third of my blood. Oh. Um, and, and I think, that, you know, we we're talking about uh, Soft Power, the show that we initially um, discussed in 2018. Yeah. And it was, you know, writing that play uh, and that musical uh, that helped me to kind of process um, what had happened to me. And first I was able, comfortable saying that my character was the victim of a hate attack. And then eventually that uh, particularly after the Georgia massacre uh, just yeah. last year, I right. felt comfortable saying that uh, that had happened to me as well. Right, right. But it's so funny that, again, when I watched that interview, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's right, that did happen to him and that was part of the play. And yet, even back then when we were talking about it, and obviously when you were trying to process it after it happened, we didn't associate it with hate crime, Asian hate, you know, which is what we are all going through now. So it's this weird evolution of, of how to describe what has been happening, maybe under the surface, but now it's so open and common and public. Yeah. I mean, when I was stabbed in 20, 2015, there was a Queens um, assemblyman uh, named Ron Kim who called a press conference to denounce anti-Asian hate and violence then. Mm -hmm. And 
I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I was a really the, you know, was that really a hate attack? The cops don't say it was a hate attack. And right. so, um, and, and I felt like, and I don't know if any, anyone else can relate to this, but that there is oddly something that feels, um, I felt shame, ashamed if I was the victim of a hate attack, which is totally counterintuitive because it should be the, you know, yes. the person who does the attack who right. feels ashamed. But uh, I think it's something that I felt I needed to work through. And so, yeah, it, there, in the show, it was portrayed as a hate attack. And then mm-hmm. I, I finally was able to acknowledge it uh, myself. Per, again, particularly after Georgia, when I realized, oh, wait, the cops don't call anything a hate attack. No, no, they don't. They still don't. And that's what hasn't really changed, unfortunately. And so, obviously, when you were saying the AAPI community is becoming more aware um, now because of everything that's been happening, that's that's the silver lining, we hope. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So people are yeah. paying more yeah. attention and non-Asians, the general public is starting to pay more attention. Although I got to tell you, David, as journalists, I kind of see the mainstream media have having moved on already, you know, from the story. I think that's probably true. I think yeah. the mainstream move, media has moved on, but it is you, everybody, you, I mean, the general public kind of re- can still remember that this happened and therefore yeah. um, can, uh, can believe that such a thing exists. Right, right. Well, I mean, the reason why uh, we I'm getting you on the show is because of this um, documentary that has come out. Uh, this, and I watched it. It's terrific. It's it's so well done, and the the voices in this documentary are so great because it's it's called the first 20, 20 years of Asian American playwriting. Um, so I uh, obviously I want to talk to you about that too because it it is intertwined in terms of the storytelling and playwrights just like any content creator, you are the ones who can change the narrative and through your writing can educate those who may not be aware of some of these issues that really do exist and history um, that we've all gone through, right? So tell me then um, what you think in terms of where Asian playwriting is now, because you're, talk about OG. I mean, you yeah, I'm, are I'm pretty OG. You're pretty OG, <laughs> man. I mean, this, no one can argue that. So, for you, having seen the span of two decades, I'm sure it's probably pretty extraordinary. And maybe in some ways it hasn't changed. I don't know. I, I'm curious. AAPI stories um, are part of the fabric of this country. Um, and people of color are used to watching stories about white people and empathizing with them. And um, The reverse has to happen as well. I don't think there's a problem in American theater with diversity. I just think you're not doing it. Because if you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, don't say you're doing it. Because we can see what you do in every season that you produce. So to some extent, if you want a full American theater, then the question also becomes, what audiences do you see that are American? These days, as Americans, we can't just say, oh, I'm Asian American, so I'm only interested in Asian American history. No, the American today needs to embrace, understand, and know that they are part of black history, black stories, Mexican stories, Latinx, all kinds of stories that make up this wonderful fabric of this country. And if these stories are not being told on the stage, you are not an American theater company. I mean, it is extraordinary in the sense that uh, when I first, my first play was produced in 1980 off Broadway in New York at the Public Theater. And I'm not the first. Um, Asian American to be produced at a legitimate New York house. That was Frank Chin with uh, Chicken Coop Chinaman in 1972. Mm-hmm. Um, but there really weren't, the, there wasn't anybody else who had been produced at a major New York theater. Right. Um, you had Wakako Yamaluchi, you had Momoko Iko who were doing important work, uh, but again, uh, hadn't been validated for what that's worth. By, uh, by by the New York theatrical establishment. Um, and now, you know, in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, um, there were supposed to be 12 new plays by Asian American writers running off Broadway. So um, the Amazing. community of writers and the amount of work and the diversity of that work has really exploded um, over the course of my lifetime. What hasn't changed so much is... Um, there's still, um, I mean, I was the first Asian American playwright to be produced on Broadway and that remained true for, uh, 
for about 30 years, I think. And now there's like four, um, which is an improvement, but um, it still is uh, incredibly difficult to get an Asian American show on Broadway. Yeah. No, I was looking at the the stats that uh, from this uh, documentary. So when it comes to theater, uh, it's still 81% white directors and only 4.5% Asian American directors. And then of course, playwrights, 5.1% Asian Americans and 71.6% white writers. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's, yeah. There, there's still a hu- huge gap. So it kind of depends how you want to measure it. Uh, <laughs> yes, there's progress and it's still pretty bad. Yeah. But let's talk about then the importance of the work that needs to be done by the Asian American playwrights. I, I sometimes wonder, do, does someone like you and others, um, because you're such a, still such a small minority feel pressure to write about the Asian American community, Asian experiences and to represent, right? I mean, is that, is, does that, does that restrict you or put pressure on you? Or do you think that's, um, something that you need to do, like you have to do? I think it's an individual matter. Um, And I believe that that's what it should be. Also, that writers of whatever communities and backgrounds and identities um, need to write the thing that's really burning for them, the thing that they really want to say, because that's when they're going to do their best work. Like it doesn't, yeah, you know, over the 40 years that I've been doing this, there have been times when I've been like, well, am I supposed to write about Asians? But yeah. I also feel like if uh, if I just do it because I'm obligated to do so, and if the work isn't good, then I don't have any value really to any. I mean, not helping the community ultimately. Yeah. Um, so, and you have examples of um, like Young Jean Lee, who was uh, became the first Asian American female playwright on Broadway in uh, either 2018 or 2019, um, who wrote a play called um, uh, Straight White Men, Mm -hmm. which was a cast of straight white men. Um, So, you know, it's not necessarily the case that um, Asian American writers will gain more success if they write about Asian subjects. Right, right, okay. Um, I do wonder though, because of what's happened in the last two years, almost two years now, can you believe it's almost been two years that we've been going through this? Um, do you feel more compelled to try to create something that reflects what's been going on? I'm, I'm more excited to create, um, things that, that speak to this moment because, you know, back in, I wrote a play called Yellow Face, which, yeah. which did pretty well in um, like, oh, oh, seven. And at that point, you know, it was sort of like the beginning of the Obama presidency. And um, I was feeling like, oh, there's, you know, multiculturalism, what we used to call multiculturalism, pretty much a settled issue now. So yeah. I don't know that I'm that interested in writing about America anymore. I want to write, I'm more, you know, what feels dangerous and exciting to me is the question of U.S.-China relations. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, um, obviously, that <laughs> didn't turn out to be the case. Yeah, and so true. as a result, uh, I personally uh, continue, uh, have, have uh, become more engaged again in dealing with American issues because uh, there's so much that I want to try to figure out about this moment uh, mm-hmm. that we live in. And I write plays to figure out how I feel about things. Okay, so can you give us a hint in terms of what some of these topics might be that you're thinking of or actually doing right now? I mean, I, I'm interested in, I've begun to do some research and talk to producers and maybe a collaborator, um, in doing a play that has something to do with the 1968 San Francisco state university, third world student strike. Um, because it feels to me like an inflection moment. It's, both the moment when the term Asian American starts to get used and therefore the beginnings of the, uh, uh, of the pulling together of a pan-Asian identity in this country. Yep. And at the same time, 1967, the year right before that, is the first time there's the popular use of the term model minority. And then 
Um, so for those of your, your listeners, who are, your viewers who don't know, uh, the San Francisco State University Third World Student Strike led to the formation of the first ethnic studies program. Right. And um, but the uh, the person who was oppo- the administrator who was opposing the strikers was a guy named Esai Hayakawa, who was Japanese American, who was a Nisei. And so, in some sense, Hayakawa embodies this sort of model minority trope, which really hadn't existed before then. And then um, the strikers, um, for me, represent the the much longer history Mm. of Asian American activism and fighting for progressive change, which then historically over the next four or five decades gets um, gets essentially appropriated by the model minority trope so that by the time you get to 2020 um, and these attacks are taking place, there's several generations of of younger Asian Americans who don't really know the the sort of true history of Asian American culture in uh, progressive change, radicalism, protesting, um, awareness of class issues, um, all those things. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like you mentioned, the conflict, that clash of that activism and wanting to be heard and recognized versus against the model minority myth that was still, you know, embraced by a lot of Asian Americans. So I think that, you know, the model minority myth hijacked uh, Asian America, which was supposed to have been a progressive project. Right. And and so I kind of want to write a book about that. Oh, I think that would be Amazing, David. Seriously, because I th- I think I told you before the interview, I, I started this uh, new course at USC, Asian American History and Journalism, because part of the problem right now and throughout history, but is that Asian American history events, issues, both the, the, the good, the bad and the ugly have never been taught. It's never been discussed and people aren't educated. So therefore they make, you know, that this false narrative has been created over the decades and centuries um, and it still exists to this day. And so it's a compounding, you know, kind of factor. It, it's not just because of COVID, this racism has sprang up. It's over 200 years plus. Right. right. And if you, you know, look at like historically, uh, people today, because of the spike in anti Asian racism, are maybe have maybe become more familiar again with the story of Vincent Chen. Yeah. But Vincent Chen, who was the uh, 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 Chinese American who got murdered by unemployed auto workers during the 1980s when there was conflict with Japan right. economically. Right. Um, Vincent Chen um, also represents, the murder of Vincent Chen represents a sort of um, signal moment for Asian Americans to start to um, organized. Right. And then I feel like, okay, this net, this next, the, the wave of hate that we've just experienced or that we're still somewhat in the midst of, um, that can become the same galvanizing event for uh, the current uh, community. Right. And, but the important factor being it's got to be sustainable, yes. right? It can't be just yet another blip of activity and then everything goes back to normal and it's, you know, swept under the rug again. Right. Yeah, because I think Asian Americans have to realize that, um, okay, maybe, you know, COVID will pass. It's really hard to feel that right now at this <laughs> moment, but COVID's going to pass. Um, and maybe the specific cause, uh, the specific hate, trigger for the hate is going to be um, alleviated. But every time there is some sort of tension between the U.S. and any other nation, it's going to come back. And historically, that has proven true. And that's why we have to fight it between the uh, and prepare for the next one. Right, right. Unfortunately, it's sad to say. And that's why I, I always refer to um, an editorial that John Cho, the actor, wrote for The New York Times. And it's one line that really struck me, which is that, you know, our acceptance in this country is conditional. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. everything's okay, and we're okay until something, some until crisis. we're not. Yeah, until we're not. And uh, it's a sad fact that that has to continue happening throughout history. And once people understand that this has been happening throughout history for a long period of time, then there's a little bit of wor- more awareness, and I I feel like that builds more empathy. That you know develops more empathy for a community. 
And so for someone like you, who again is a phenomenal award-winning playwright, to take this kind of issue and then try to funnel it into the mainstream, you know, I'm sure is challenging and yet probably pretty exciting, you know. Yeah, um, and, and I also wanna, the other thing about the San Francisco State University third world student strike is it was a third world student strike, which is the term we used to use, but basically, uh, what we would now say, uh, a people of color or BIPOC people uniting. Yeah. And there's this false narrative right. that gets promoted by the right wing and the media that, uh, particularly the right wing, that says that the, the, that the uh, anti-Asian attacks of the past two years are primarily committed by black and brown people. Right. And statistically, that's just not true. That's right. Um, uh, Andrew Sullivan, the conservative commentator, uh, linked he said, oh, it's overwhelmingly black people. And he linked to a study that actually said that 67% of the attacks are committed by white people. So it's just an, the, the, the right wing wants to divide people of color in this country. And it's important to realize that we have shared interests yes. with black people, brown people, you know, indigenous people. Um, exactly. All, all sorts. Of, yeah, exactly. And, you know, as you know, David, I mean, the model minority myth was created by white supremacy to to create that wedge uh, in between all the people of color, communities of color. So it was, you have to give them credit. It was pretty brilliant because it kind of worked, you know? Yes, and, and that's what I, I feel like, you know, I hopefully can address by looking at the, the student strike. Oh, I think you should absolutely do that. I would be, I would be first in line for to buy a ticket to that to that play. Would it be a play or a musical? What do you think? I don't know. You know, I've talked with a few um, of my collaborators about this and they were like, you know, you should probably like figure out the story first. <laughs> yeah, you may, maybe so. Maybe so. Well, David, I just returned from New York City and I hadn't been since pre-COVID. I had to go for this event and um, uh, I didn't get to go to the theater this time. I did get to go to the Met Opera, which is one of my favorite things to do in New York City. But it was it was one of those things where I saw New York coming back to life, right? And I'm sure you, again, being a playwright and depending on the theater, it's been a long year and a half or so, right? Uh, of, of the theater being dark and no live production going on. Um, can you tell me what that was like for all of you and, and what your hope is now? Because again, we're still going through the pandemic, right? Now it's Omicron and all this stuff, but Tell me what it's been like for for you and your colleagues and, you know, the theater world. Yeah, I mean, it's been incredibly difficult, of course. Um, uh, and if when I was talking a moment ago about there being uh, 10 productions, 10 new shows by Asian American writers, and then the theater closes down, um, you know, that's incredibly heartbreaking. And I have friends who have been out of work for a year and a half, you know, we're out of work for a year and a half. Um, I think writers have it a little easier because A, we, you know, we said this, we're used to sitting in our rooms by ourselves uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that's what we do. And many of us um, can also work in other mediums. So there's a lot of work in film and television. And so I was uh, very fortunate to be able to stay employed and busy, but you know, the, the the, the love that we have of live performance um, is uh, devastating to, you know, Broadway has never shut down yeah. um, it, uh, for this, I mean, for this length of time. I don't know if it ever even sh shut down for like a week or so. Um, I know after 9-11, it Not shut down. 9-11, I think that, that was the only time, um, yeah. But um, so it, it is the, the most traumatic event in the history of the American theater. Yeah. And uh, and it's also, we found, you know, it's tricky, we're finding this right now, it's tricky to start up. In some sense, it's it's heartbreaking, but relatively easy to shut down. Um, and starting back up again, uh, particularly with these variants yeah. and, you know, feeling, okay, we're gonna go, and then, oh, there's, um, you know, uh, there's Delta, there's Omicron, things, uh, Productions are having to shut down, right. and they're experiencing this in London as well. So um, we're just very funkily starting <laughs> up again, um, and it'll be. I, it looks like it's going to be sort of three steps forward, two steps back yeah. um, until we are able to be 
um, back on our completely back on our feet. Right, right. Um, tell tell me then, you know, for people who are listening and watching, um, I remember, re you know, I, I'm going to refer to this before I ask the question. I interviewed George Takei a few years ago, and um, uh, it was because he his uh, his play that he was in. And now why am I completely blanking on that name? Um, Allegiance. Allegiance. Allegiance, which was, oh, God, so beautiful and heartbreaking. Uh, but he was talking about the fact that um, Asian Americans still don't support Asian American theater as they should. Like, he said, I'll go to an August Wilson play, and the theater will be full of African Americans to support that play and the theater. But then he'll go to an Asian American play by you. I think he named you. And he's like, there'll be a sprinkling of Asians, but it'll be mostly like white people and others. And he's like, we really need to support each other in this way, support the community. Do you feel like that has changed? Because I, I think I interviewed him a few years back about this as well. Do you think that is changing or do you think we still need to, you know, push the Asian American community to support Asian American theater and, and plays? I think it's easier in i mean i in some sense um there's not necessarily a theater going habit yeah. that asian americans grow up with right um and so part of it is um simply cultural but not even cultural uh, where it comes you know a, a particular cultural traits about being asian it really has to do with many of us being um either, you know, our parents are immigrants or our own generation is, uh, and, and there's, we are not used to, and therefore not comfortable right. going to the theater. Right. So I think there needs to be more, I, I, I've always also tended to go, Asian Americans, you have to go to the theater more. But I also feel like the theaters have more responsibility to create environments in which um, people who are not their traditional audience, who are not um, older, wealthier, whiter can feel comfortable mm. uh, because when people feel comfortable, they're more likely to go someplace, um, go to concerts, you know, go to sports sports events, um, and you generally see a more diverse audience in those sorts of venues. Yeah. Um, so, what can theaters do to uh, let people feel that they're welcome? There's a um, Jeremy Harris's play, Slave Play. Um, he's an African-American writer and it reopened on Broadway and just little things like putting in the, on their website, like, how do you dress when you go to the theater? That mm. that's like a thing for some people who aren't used to doing it and therefore feel uncomfortable. Right. Um, there's a lot of things that I think theaters can do to make okay. audiences feel more comfortable. OK, hopefully they'll take that into consideration. I think they need to do whatever they can to get the get the audiences back, certainly, and then maybe draw in new audiences. Yeah. Um, and hopefully younger audiences, too, that become more aware of, of the beauty of live theater. I'm telling you, there's nothing like live performance. It's it makes you feel like I said, when I went to the Met, it made me feel alive. To see that. You know, we've all spent we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years um, watching Netflix and, <laughs> and, you know, and television is great. And I work in television and it's you know better than it's been in my lifetime. Yeah. And um, I I think you talk about the effect of the shutdown. Um, I think it makes many of us crave live contact again. Yeah. Um, and that's the experience that you have in the theater. Um having a, a social moment with really a bunch of strangers and yet feeling unified and um, focused and part of the event that's happening on the stage. And that is not, you, you can't get that. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch something on television, or even even if it's a Broadway show that's being televised. I'm not going to sit there and clap, you know, in my living room, right? So, yeah, it's very different. Well, um, I don't know if you know this, David, but I'm on the board of East West Players. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, our theater is named after you. It's the David Henry Huang Theater. So I have um, indirectly been experiencing what the theater has been going through. So we're excited to get our season going starting in February with Assassins. Great. Right. Yeah. 
play a musical, which was supposed to debut before COVID. And then we had, to, of course, shut down. So it's, you know, I think it's been a struggle, but I think everyone is looking forward to trying to get back to some sort of new normal, I suppose. Um, well, before I let you go, David, because I know you're a busy man, um, is there, I know you have this concept of this play based on um, the third world SF state, but uh, is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about? Um, so we still, uh, we're working on a new version of this musical soft power that we hit, ho hope to bring to Broadway. Um, that's more post 2020 version, uh, that, that addresses some of what we've been talking about, um, more specifically, um, the role that AAPIs can play, um, in, in our country in the current crisis in democracy. Um, I, uh, am working on a new version, uh, with Disney, of our uh, 2000 um, Broadway musical, Aida, with oh. music by Elton John and lyrics by Tim Rice. Um, we're doing a, a, a new version of that. Um, wow. I have a, um, I'm working on a movie with uh, Gemma Chan for Gemma Chan and the star in, which I think is gonna be announced in the next few weeks, but I can't really talk about that right now. Okay. Um, and, um, and I have a couple of TV shows that I'm working on. So, you know, I've managed to keep busy during the pandemic. Oh, um, and there's some operas. Um, there is a new opera um, at, which will debut at Washington National Opera um, in the spring mm -hmm. um, called, uh, it, called Written in Stone. But and we have, Huang Rao, the composer, and I have written a piece called The Rift for that, which is about the creation of the Vietnam Memorial. Oh. Um, and also there's a musical version of my play M. Butterfly, uh, an opera version, which will open at Santa Fe Opera this summer. That was supposed to open before the pandemic. Okay. And a revival of an opera that I wrote with Bright Shung, uh, which is based on Dream of the Red Chamber, um, that's going to come back in the spring to San Francisco Opera. David, you're such a slacker. God, I mean, you're just like sitting around doing nothing. Oh my God, that's so much stuff going on for you. Well, you know, also <laughs> when you can't go out to the theater, then I guess I just stay home and work more, so. <laughs> wow, well, congratulations on all of that. I can't wait to see what's, you know, when they all come out and perform and, you know, on stage and cinema and screen. So it sounds like pretty much all platforms, we're gonna see your work, so that's terrific. I, and I, this, the new version of Soft Power, I think, is a brilliant idea. That's great. A, that's, that's a great we're, idea. We're, we're hoping, but we're fortunate to have, you know, commercial producers that uh, continue to be very much behind the piece. That's amazing. Well, David, it was such a pleasure seeing you again um, and talking to you after a couple of years um, and kind of reflecting on what's happened um, over the last two years. So thank you so much for your time. Great. And, thank you. And yeah. happy holidays. Yes, you too. Take care. I definitely look forward to all the new work that David's going to be coming out with um, in the future. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of stuff that's coming out. That's uh, David Henry Huang, you know, uh, project. So <laughs> definitely look forward to that. And again, um, that PBS documentary um, called The First 20, 20 Years of Asian American Playwrights, uh, that is currently on. You can watch it online or on PBS. I highly recommend it. It's 30 minutes, but it's it's talking to a lot of different Asian American playwrights and their sort of thoughts on, you know, identity and um, the AAPI community and, and a lot of serious issues and about theater and, and writing. So I recommend watching that. And I, 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 I just want to leave you with this. It's been a tough, another tough year for the AAPI community. Uh, the anti-Asian hate still continues, as many of us know, even though mainstream media has moved on from the story. So we can't um, sit back. We can't go back to what life was like before and think that it's all okay. We have to continue speaking up, speaking out. We have to continue raising that awareness through education, through storytelling, through just creating new bonds with people and sharing your experiences because that's where that change is going to happen. So I encourage that and just stay brave, stay courageous, stay loud, uh, and just do your part in any small way that you can, okay? Because it's gonna take all of us.
It's going to take all of us. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Happy holidays, everyone. See ya.